Welcome to all of you. This virtual event is not the experience of our in-person events, but I hope you've had a little time to see and greet each other from afar. I promise our guests and I will do everything we can to make this conversation stimulating and perhaps provocative and give you plenty of things to think about later. This is an exclusive event for our Spotlight Club members, and I welcome and thank you for supporting iNewsSource. For those of you who are friends of our friends and not deeply familiar with our work, iNewsSource is dedicated to serving the San Diego region with investigative and accountability journalism, <clears throat> excuse me, that aims to have a tangible positive impact in our lives. For 10 years, we have covered a range of topics, education, healthcare, social impacts, infrastructure, and the bare bones of government accountability. Ability. Our work has changed laws and it's changed lives. With the coronavirus pandemic, our news team has exposed failures in public institutions that can be fixed. And in each of these stories, which could be number heavy and bureaucratic, we have placed people first, illustrating the hard facts with personal narratives. <clears throat> James B. Steele is a master of that kind of storytelling and of that kind of fact gathering. Jim and his longtime reporting partner, Donald Barlett, are the nation's most honored investigative reporting team. Their work has received two Pulitzer Prizes and some 50 other national journalism awards. Two of their eight books have been New York Times bestsellers. They began working together at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and their writing has appeared in Time, Vanity Fair, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. One of the reasons many of you support and trust iNewsSource is because of our data-based journalism. We have Jim Steele and Don Barlett to thank for this invaluable tool. Barlett and Steele pioneered in the use of reporting methods now standard in the profession. In 1972, they used a computer to analyze more than a thousand cases of violent crime in Philadelphia their project entitled Crime and Injustice was the largest computer assisted reporting project of its time and was widely replicated by other journalists for years afterwards. Jim is joining us today to talk about a subject we've heard a lot about over the last decades, the disappearing middle class in America. He and Don investigated this phenomenon 30 years ago and published their findings in 1992 in the first book entitled America, what went wrong. Today, an updated version released in June adds the tag, the crisis deepens. Jim and I are gonna talk about the crisis and the ways it can be remedied. And we're also gonna talk about how the sausage is made. That is how journalists find stories that matter most to people's lives and how we use the tools and our skills to verify, fact check, and tell those stories. James Steele, thank you for being here. Thank you, you very can, much, Lori. I know you can hear the applause, right? It's, it's tough on a Zoom call. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just, let's just jump in here with a little bit of background. Um, yeah. For those who haven't had the pleasure of reading your most recent book, tell us briefly about the topic and how you got the idea to tackle it some 30 years ago. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the chance to be here with you and visit with you. I always love to talk about journalism. And the heart of this book, of course, is journalism. And what you do out there is, is very well known in journalism nationally. So it's a delight for me to visit with you and some of your, your friends there. Uh, we didn't start out 30 years ago to write about the middle class. We started out on a much more limited basis. At the time, there was a, something called corporate restructuring. Companies that had been around a long time were suddenly being bought and sold and taken apart and employees tossed out. And, we began examining these companies, like what was happening to them, what was happening to the workers. Economists were saying, yes, this is just the way America renews itself. It's all part of that process. But when we went out, interviewed people, reviewed the records and began a data analysis of tax and other economic data, we found something far more profound, that it wasn't just a corporate restructuring story. You had a whole class of people, the American middle class, finding their incomes going down their benefits being cut, uh, their retirement endangered. That's what got us thinking about the much bigger issue of the middle class. 
Uh, the original book was uh, quite a sensation at the time. It was a factor in the 92 presidential election. Candidates waved it around. Bill Clinton said it profoundly influenced his economic thinking. Uh, its most salient point was, um, and it was quite controversial at the time, we said, unless we change our course, uh, income inequality is going to grow in this country. And it's going to be worse and worse. Uh, that was controversial. The Wall Street Journal at the time attacked us calling us the sister soldiers of economic populism. I wear that like a little merit badge on my lapel, by the way. But um, anyway, uh, as time went on and Don and I began observing many of the trends we'd written about back then, uh, the thought occurred to us that we really needed to come back and, and look at this subject again. So what we've done in the new book is we've gone back and looked at all those major points that we pinpointed back in 92 and seeing what's happened to them, taxes, trade, deregulation, benefits, healthcare, all of those things. Uh, and what we found is that in almost every area, things have worsened. Um, and as a result of that, the, the book, but what the book tells us isn't just that the middle class is in this trouble, that people don't have savings, they don't have healthcare, pensions. The book explains how we got there. And it also explains uh, you know, what those policies were in Washington and Wall Street that basically ended up decimating the middle class. A lot of people who aren't doing well somehow think it's their fault. But in fact, you can see that there are any number of things at work that have caused this particular problem. So Jim, one of the things that, that I think you, you pride yourself most on investigative journalists do, and that is being able to quantify um, what, you're, what you're looking at. It's not yeah. just anecdotal information. I mean, your book has beautiful anecdotes, but it wouldn't hold up if it didn't have the data. Exactly. And I'm, th I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about how you got the data and what kinds of data it was, um, the public nature of it. So, so people know this wasn't just your theory and you talked right. to a bunch of people and said, hey, this is the story. Um, it's really grounded in data. Absolutely. And uh, Don, I make a big point of that. The human stories aren't enough. And in our, in our youth, we would see a lot of great human stories. But you wondered, is that all there is? You know, what's behind that? Is this an exception or is it part of a broader pattern? So what we found in this story, most of the analysis, and Don and I have always done our own analysis of numbers, heavily tax data. And that's where we came up with the conclusion back in the early 90s that the middle class was shrinking as a result of these various forces. And we basically defined the middle class back then as 20 to 50,000. We made the point in places like New York, uh, certainly you had to earn more than that, but nationally that was the standard. And we showed statistically based on the analysis of, of that tax data, why the middle class was shrinking from previous years. And what kinds of tax data was available? Well, I mean, you can't uh, get someone's tax returns, obviously. You can't get their tax returns, but uh, I'm glad you asked this because it is amazing what is out there in terms of documents of all sorts. At the time, it's called Statistics of Income by the Internal Revenue Service. They publish it every year. They publish it for individuals. They publish it for corporations. It has breakdowns within it by income groups. It has breakdowns by who gets dividends, who gets pensions. You name it. It's all there. Well, in those days, what we had to do was go over to the Free Library of Philadelphia and Xerox those pages, come back, input the information by hand. Well, nothing illustrates what's happened in journalism more than that today. For all the updates in this, I didn't have to leave my study. We didn't have to do that because you can download everything. The IRS has all the most recent data online and actually they even have some historical data as well. So I, and that's why I refer to it in some ways, this is the golden age of journalism. I mean, what you can do sitting at your computer now compared to what you used to have to do is astonishing. So you had, we had to learn originally one, two, three, a spreadsheet program. Now we use Excel. There's a whole range of other ones as I know you and a lot of your, your colleagues there uh, in San Diego know about, but that's the heart of a lot of analysis to crunch those numbers. And we've always believed that part of the great independence of journalism is to be able to do that yourself. I mean, there are a lot of wonderful organizations out there that do this, that make these studies. But when you do it yourself and you see those conclusions, you can state those results with much more power and strength because you know exactly where those numbers came from. So to pick up on that, Jim, we, 
We've all heard the old adage that figures don't lie, but liars figure. So uh, trust is a huge issue today. Perhaps yes. today more than 30 years ago, although tr trust in government has always been an issue, back to the forefathers. Um, but how do you persuade the public that your data and the way you have analyzed it is, is in fact believable? I think you just lay it out there. And, and one of the great things today, of course, uh, is that somebody can email you and say, where did you get this? And you can tell them exactly. You can tell them the page number if that's the case. I did a big project on student debt a few years ago. And in every statistic we had in it, we had it hypertext so somebody could go exactly to the report. You know, that's a great thing that you can do now that you couldn't do in the past. Uh, you, I think what you, we have to do is we have to keep being factual. We have to show the numbers. We have to show what the basis of them, where they came from. Some people will believe that. Some people won't. I'll give an example on taxes. Taxes are very controversial. And when there are tax cuts, some people will say this will stimulate the economy and others will say it won't. You can't prove that one way or another. But what you can show with that data is who receives the benefit and who doesn't. That's a fact. It's right there in black and white. So we try to stick with that as much as we can and, and try to leave the speculation uh, to others. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some people a spoiler alert here. Um, I'm going to tell you, uh, we're going to discuss two answers to the questions that we put to the audience in your poll. And um, one of them is, uh, you concluded in your book that, quote, the single greatest driver of income inequality in America is the U.S. tax system. So for those of you who said true, you, you had that right. And we also found to be true another question, that in 2017, the top 4% of those who filed tax returns earned as much as the bottom 57%. Did this surprise you? We knew it was heading in that direction, um, but I think the extent of the number did surprise us, especially when you go back uh, to like 1960, where the top 4% then earned as much as the bottom 35%. So you see right away the spread. More people at the top, more people at the bottom, the middle class squeezed in between. So it's statistically clear there. What was interesting when we did the original uh, book all, the, all that time ago, it was controversial. Nobody finds that subject controversial anymore. I mean, everybody agrees the middle class is being hammered. And by, and by middle class, I mean economically. A lot of people mentally think they're in the middle class when in fact they make too much money uh, to be in that. So you know, that's, I think, one of the big, the big changes that's happened. Um, let me, uh, I can see you again here trying to, but, uh, we came to that conclusion on, on the income tax simply because, I mean, a lot of young people to this day and a lot of older people probably don't know this. As recently as 1980, uh, the top rate on some income, on income was 70%. The top rate today is 37%. Uh, in the 1980s, a whole series of bits of legislation began to be enacted, reducing the top rates. Some of these were put under the, the category of, of tax reform, supposedly making things better for everybody. But in fact, what was overlooked in that were the, was the fact that the rates were reduced significantly for people. That's been happening one way or another. Clinton raised them for a while, some other times, a couple of places have gone up, but overall, it's been going down. And uh, the 2017 Trump tax bill is perhaps the granddaddy of them all at this point. Can you, you talk a lot in your book about debt? all kinds of debt <laughs> and, yeah. and kind of the way debt has become uh, the way corporations operate. And you also talk about student debt. If I, if I have this correctly, I think you said student debt is the greatest amount of debt next to mortgage debt. Correct. Um, Correct. Can you talk a little bit about that debt and how, how it, it has fueled the shrinking of the middle class? The student debt is one of the great crises of our time. And we're going to have to deal with that uh, some people think it should all be forgiven. Other people think that's not politically feasible. It might be forgiven for people at the very lowest rim, rungs of the ladder, the economic ladder. 
but we need to do something there because it's discouraging home ownership. It's discouraging people starting families. It's discouraging people starting businesses. And one of the reasons it's happened is because we turned that program over back in the eighties to private contractors. The whole student debt program began in the beginning to help people who didn't have enough money to go to college. And then the states began to withdraw to, to not put in as much money as they used to. All of these things meant students, their families had to borrow more money. Uh, we suggest in the conclusion of the book that we need to figure out a way to deal with this. Forgive some of it, uh, maybe remove, remove uh, the extensive interest payments that some people have to pay now. It's a very complex subject, but we need to do something about that because it's a whole generation of people who've got this chain around their neck and it's prohibiting them from being really part of the American dream anyway. Mm -hmm. So talk about corporate debt and how, how that has, has basically contributed to the loss of jobs and the shrinking of the middle class. Cor corporate debt is at an all-time high. And by the way, everything we're talking about, and I should stress this in the beginning too, everything we're talking about, the bulk of the book was written really before COVID-19. I mean, we have some significant inserts in the book dealing with that. But all the conditions we're talking about, the middle class in trouble, their health care in peril, not having retirement, all of those things were in place before the virus hit us. And one of the reasons corporate debt, which I'm glad you brought up, is so important, is that when corporate debt is high, which it is right now, it's around 10 trillion, uh, when that happens, then when there are uh, cutbacks, employees are usually the first ones to get cut. For some reason, banks don't want to take a smaller cut. So what do the corporations do? They look down the ladder to see who's most vulnerable, where they can make those, those changes. So they can pay the interest on your debt? They can pay the on interest on the debt. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the size of corporate debt is always a, a factor. One of the reasons the debt is up so high, too, is that there is a tax deduction for interest on corporate debt that's been around for years and years and years. When we wrote about this 30 years ago, uh, a lot of people were amazed by it. They just had no idea that it was the, the factor it was. This has ballooned many times in excess of what it was back then. And it's been one of the principal uh, things fueling a lot of the, the private equity movement in terms of the companies that are taken over, uh, dismantled employees very often put out to pasture, uh, workforce is reduced one way or another. That corporate debt, that, that interest on corporate debt, which is a tax write-off has been one of the things that's fueled it. So basically taxpayers end up fueling a lot of these activities that end up being very, very adverse for the average worker out there in, in society. And there was a time, <clears throat> if I'm recalling this correctly, that consumers could write off their own debt. Yes. And that's no longer the case, but corporations can still write off their, their interest on their debt. Yes, uh, taxpayers can still write off mortgage interest debt, mm -hmm. but, but credit card debt they can't. And a range of those. If you're a renter, you're you're basically out to lunch out, out, out to lunch on that one. So you're right. There, there are all kinds of things that have been removed on that. And of course, in California, in the Trump tax bill, the uh, as it was in many other states, the elimination of the deduction for state and local taxes, which is a big issue, and uh, that was eliminated as well. And it's been a very severe had very severe impact mm -hmm. on on those states that have tax rates. Mm -hmm. uh, of that size. I would like to talk about the, the, the tax bill of 2017, but before we get there, um, can you say that this problem is a bipartisan or nonpartisan problem? I mean, you have, you have chronicled the problems through the decades when there have been different administrations and different mm -hmm. uh, majorities in Congress. And, and the chronicling you've done has shown this problem to be getting worse and worse. So can you talk a bit about that and why, why is that? Uh, many of these problems have been uh, joint deals by both parties. I mean, deregulation is a perfect example of that. The, the, the industries that were deregulated, uh, both Democrats and Republicans thought that was a great idea, the idea of cutting red tape. Uh, the same thing was true of the financial services industry. A lot of Democrats led, led the way on that. So both parties have. 
the Democrats have been a little, I should say the Republicans have been much more aggressive, obviously, on reducing taxes than the Democrats have. So the Democrats themselves have signed on to some of these tax bills in the past. I think that's probably the principal difference between the two parties. The Republicans would just as soon have no taxes at all. The Democrats, I think, realize that that's part of the way we fund the country and how we do things. So that's a significant difference there. But what's happened is, is in things like health, look, look at, look at uh, the Affordable Care Act, which is a very modest attempt to deal with a problem in the society, which is the uninsured. Uh, Democrats got that through in, Ob in Obama's first term. It's been under attack ever since then. I, I, I talked to a conservative fellow I know several years ago and I asked him, I said, well, which, what's, more, what's more radical on the American scene, uh, the Affordable Care Act or Medicare? He said, oh no, the Affordable Care Act. Absolutely ridiculous statement. I mean, it doesn't even come close to the magnitude of something like Medicare. And yet that's how polarized we've become. And that's how polarized, unfortunately, many on the Republican side have become over that issue. And healthcare is a huge thing out there right now. It's, it's very big because not only the people who are uninsured, uh, who couldn't afford the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, uh, but now the people who are losing their employer paid coverage because of COVID-19, because they're furloughed from their jobs and they don't have that coverage. Uh, there's some estimates, the Kaiser Foundation in California is estimated, I think, as many as 27 million people may lose their health care coverage the longer this goes on. That's a staggering thing that goes to the heart of our failures in this country on health care. So let's talk about the tax bill of 2017. The, the president, could, he said that not a single rich person will be benefiting from this, um, implying, if not saying it straight out, that the middle class would be gaining from this. You talked a little bit a few minutes ago about how state and local tax deductions were taken away, and that is something that more people in the middle class would, would um, it take, take advantage of, a deduction. Sure. Um, can you talk about any other um, parts of that and, and address that quote? I mean, we know the, the president says a lot of things, um, but you know, people, again, people are looking somewhere for what they can believe, right? Yeah. And um, when they hear that, they probably do think that this is going to help me. And maybe you can give us some numbers, I think, that were in your book about um, how much the middle class actually gained from this tax cut and how much others did. That is one of the president's real whoppers, that no rich person would benefit from that bill. Uh, people earning one million or more, uh, the entire class of people, received on average a tax cut over the next 10 years after the bill was passed of $64,000 a year. If you were in the heart of the middle class, let's just say you're making 50 to 75,000 roughly in that, that care, your tax cut was, was a little over $800 a year. And it goes to the heart of why sometimes these things get through. If you get a little tax cut, you think, well, gee, that, that's really nice. I'm getting a little money here not realizing somebody else is getting a lot of money. And that's been the problem with our tax policy. We keep shoveling these tax breaks to people who don't need any more money in most cases. We also did a computation on, on that whole class of, of taxpayers over a million. Over the decade for that tax bill, that class will receive in excess of half a trillion dollars in tax benefits. So in other words, we're giving that much money to a group of people who don't need the money, which I think is kind of shocking when you think of what some of the needs are in this country and where some of that money could go. And let, me t let me just give you, you, were, you asked a great question earlier about anecdotes and taxes. Let me just tell you where that came from. The heart of the work that Don and I do over the years is very heavily public records. It's not secret stuff. It's not, not somebody, it's not me meeting somebody in a parking garage wearing a trench coat and somebody sh putting stuff in my arms and saying, okay, look at this gym and then blow the lid off this. Most of this stuff is out there in the public domain. All those numbers I told you are extrapolated from the Joint Committee on Taxation report based on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Now, the half trillion, you won't see that number in there, but all you have to do 
is look at what the average tax cut is for people in that category and multiply it by the, by the taxpayers who are right there in the report. So it's not secret. Most of this stuff isn't secret. It's just right there. You just have to take that extra step uh, to run the numbers. It's not even very complicated arithmetic. <laughs> it's called multiplication. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we've made this point over the years. I mean, a lot of people think investigative reporting, it's this dramatic thing and exciting. Well, a lot of it is just going through the records, just going through the documents, running those numbers. And what becomes exciting is that conclusion, you know, not, not the process itself. Mm -hmm. so, so is there, if you look at the, the division here, and that's one issue, is there a way to track whether um, the millionaires who are receiving these big um, tax um, advantages are giving the money to nonprofits or reinvesting it in businesses that could benefit others? Is there a way to measure that? I don't think there's a systematic way to measure it. Uh, you could certainly anecdotally do that if somebody wanted to uh, make their act act actions public. Uh, and you can also see how much people in various categories give to charity. You can do that overall, not by the name of the person. But again, that's, that's a, a bit of data that is available in IRS, mm -hmm. in, in the statistics of income, which I was mentioning. So you can do some of that on, a, on an overall class basis. That's, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna talk to you about one of the predictions in your book. Um, you write that women and African Americans will continue to move into the workforce, that they will receive substandard wages, substandard pensions, and substandard fringe benefits. And for the first time, they will be joined by a new minority, white males in manufacturing and service jobs. Um, many of the white males you interview in your, in your book who have lost jobs were in their late 50s. They're in that space where They've lost their job. They can't find another one. They, they still they don't qualify for Medicare yet or Social Security. Can you talk a little bit about that whole statement that women and African Americans will continue to be more numerous in the workforce, but will not be making having the benefits and wages, and and this new minority you identified. The uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, data going all the way back to the late seventies pretty much confirms the one on white males. And, and uh, that, that income has been either stagnant or slightly down, depending on the year, for, for a long time now. Uh, one of the ones we updated significantly for the new book had to do with healthcare and retirement. And women have made very little progress since the original book back in the early 90s. Uh, their retirement benefits are significantly less than men's, uh, their healthcare benefits, or the, num the number of have coverage in healthcare is also significantly less than men in many cases. Very often, and one of, one of the things we wrote about, um, not in this book, but have written about in the past that goes to the heart of this, is bankruptcy. Uh, most of the ba bankruptcy reform several years ago was supposedly about people going down to the Caribbean to live high on the hog. When you look at who files personal bankruptcy in this country, it's mainly women, young women uh, whose husbands may have flown the coup or older women whose husbands very often have died. And in each case, they may be facing health healthcare uh, insurance issues. And that's what very often drives them into deep debt and why they seek bankruptcy protection. So we've made very little progress on that over the years. And, uh, I think that's among the things that, that is deeply concerns us in terms of the middle class. We need uh, to find a way to help uh, women, African Americans, um, uh, white males who've been displaced, and we haven't really paid much attention to any of those areas on any significant policy level. Well, I'm looking at the job numbers too, when we talk about unemployment and people who are employed, um, it seems that one of the things we need to pay attention to is what does it mean to be employed? Um, there might be lots of people who are employed, but maybe they have two or three jobs or they're working a job that paid half what their old job paid. That's a great point. And that's one of the things, even before COVID-19, 
when uh, Washington, the Trump administration was crowing about the 3.5% uh, unemployment rate. I mean, obviously it's better if you're working than if you're not working. Nobody disputes that. But I think lost in that 3.5% was the fact that many people are in fact working two jobs. And, uh, and, and that's because a lot of these jobs just don't pay what, what they should have. One of the things that amazed us from the, the publication of the original book back in the early 90s uh, to the update was uh, median family income, if it had kept pace with inflation just between then and now, would have been roughly around $70,000 a year for a, for a family. Instead, it's around 62,000. And that means you know half the people are making above that, half or below that. But it's, that's what I mean when I say most Americans are in dire straits. Most Americans don't have any savings. I don't know about all of you, um, but an image I'm never going to get out of my head uh, that happened after the virus struck was um, a week or two when companies had furloughed people and you saw on television uh, these lines of cars all over the country, various places, people getting boxes of food. These weren't people who had been rounded up underneath the viaducts of interstate highways, homeless people like every big city has. I mean, these were working people of a week before that who suddenly were thrown out of work and had absolutely nothing to fall back on. You know, that's, if you're doing okay in this society, you don't very often see those people, but they're there and they are the majority of the population right now. I found it a stunning statistic too about um, the number of people who um, have no savings. You talked about no savings, but no. people who have can't even come up with $400 in an emergency. I think you said almost half of Americans can't even come up with $400 if they needed that yeah. for an emergency. That made it. That, that was one of the few statistics that we didn't um, produce on our own, but. Uh, that was a study out of the New York Federal Reserve. I don't know if any of you, but I don't think of the New York Federal Reserve as this wild left-wing think tank. I mean, they came up with this study that came to that conclusion that that's how close to the edge most people are. And you read that study in detail, and one of the other chilling things in it is that people have so little money that a lot of people are foregoing uh, health uh, physicals, health checks, things that bother them, because very often, even if they're covered in some cases by insurance, out-of-pocket expenses make it impossible for them to seek that. And it, every doctor will tell you, when you forego that kind of maintenance on the body, down the road, it very often leads to a, a higher cost and a more uh, significant health issue for that person. So. Yeah, I, I, that study, I think, is one of the most amazing things done in the last decade, because that's from such a respected outfit, showing just how close to the edge most Americans are. So, Jim, we've spent a half an hour talking about how gloomy everything is. Um, so let's let's ask the question: Is there reason for hope for what was once a vibrant middle class, and how how do we as a nation um, produce those results? We have to have the will. I mean, I think this is what we, we say in the book. This need not be. Uh, there are times in our history uh, when there have been crises over the last hundred years where with enough public pressure, Congress has acted. One of the most uh, famous ones was the Food and Drug Act in 1906. People were being poisoned by uh, not just prescriptions, but uh, uh, bad food, packaging, the whole thing. Uh, the people eventually rose up, Congress enacted, passed the Food and Drug Act, Pure Food and Drug Act. The same with the income tax. The income tax was to basically help out average people who through the tariff were paying high prices based on all their consumer goods. On through the years, you see that same kind of thing. Social Security is the same thing with, with under Roosevelt and Medicare under uh, Johnson. 
at a certain point, people say, enough is enough. We need, we need these things to happen. So obviously it depends on who we send to Washington. And the other point, I think, which we, a strong point we make in this book, which is quite different than uh, the first book, we have a much more stronger call to action. We need to think totally differently about the way we're going to solve problems in this country. The private market has been a wonderful uh, uh, factor in the growth of America, creating wealth and creating certainly the middle class in the past, very powerful, positive force. But right now it's not lifting all boats and we need to figure out some ways to uh, create jobs, to infuse into the economy through infrastructure, uh, research, other factors. We need to do these things to help people out. And at the top of that list, in addition to jobs, is probably healthcare. Healthcare is once again paramount. I mean, look at us right now. If we did have the kind of healthcare system that almost every other industrial nation has, all these people thrown out of work right now, they wouldn't be without their health care, but they are today. And the price of them paying for health care on their own is basically prohibitive for most of them. I mean, there are ways to do it, but they don't have that kind of money. Uh, one of these days we'll have that in this country. I mean, I hope I live to see it uh, and we'll be a better nation for it when it happens. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, this, we don't, but it can happen. I think if enough people express their view, send the right people to Washington and people get the message and do those things. It's not gonna happen overnight. There's a lot of things to be done, but I'm hoping we get started pretty soon. <laughs> well, I wanna remind everyone that you can certainly put your questions in the chat. We have a few coming in. I wanna open this up to, to questions. Um, we can get started with, with one. Uh, someone's one of our uh, attendees is asking about the current administration's policies and have they improved the NAFTA situation? We have a section in the new book on uh, NAFTA and uh, basically it's, it's not a significant change uh, as, as far as I can tell. I've done quite a bit of assessment on that because I followed the earlier, I did all the, <coughs> excuse me, I did all the original reporting on Mexico in terms of the famous maquiladoras and all of that right before NAFTA was. So I'm, it's an area I'm familiar with. Uh, there was a lot of hullabaloo about uh, the US MCA agreement, United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. But I think it's, I think it's NAFTA light. I mean, there, there's a thing in it like Wisconsin dairy farmers can now sell more milk in Canada. Um, I guess winemakers in California and Oregon can now sell more wine to the British Columbia state stores. Uh, that's all fine and good. These are, but the United Auto Workers um, who followed this pretty closely because most of the work down there has to do with auto parts say that it's basically not much of a change at all. So I, I give Trump credit that he's focused on trade because Don and I have written about trade off and on for many years, but I don't think he's gone about it in a way that's produced many, many positive results, either in NAFTA or with his uh, dealings with China either. So we have a question from Mel Katz. Where does equality education for all figure in, the, in increasing the middle class? Education, needless to say, is a hugely important thing and it remains, I'm not an expert in education, I'm gonna stress that. Uh, most of the work I've done has to do with economics and things of that sort, though I have looked very much at issues like job training in the past. Obviously that's an extremely important thing, but I think even if we had that, uh, unless we had the kinds of policies really at the top that encourage uh, industrial activity, commercial activity uh, that are amenable to jobs, uh, that will only go so far. And that's why I think healthcare is, is also one of those things that's so important uh, until we get that straightened out, till we get a, a foundation for people. That's gonna be something that keeps an awful lot of families right next to the edge with, if you lose your job, suddenly you lose everything. 
and you have no way that you can take care of yourself. We have another one here from Dale Yonke. What role has globalization and outsourcing impact had in impacting the middle class? A huge impact. And uh, Don, I've written about this, uh, in not just the original book, but in subsequent books. Yeah, it's had, it's had a huge impact on that. And the fact of the matter is we as a country uh, were the greatest boosters of free trade. And that's fine, but we were frankly taken advantage of from time to time by various countries, uh, by their policies. And we should have been at least more cognizant of that in terms of our open door policy on certain things. Um, I think in the case of Trump has made a big point on China and he's certainly right about China, a lot of their policies, they subsidize industries. That's very hard for a democratic society which doesn't believe in doing that with various industries as we don't to compete on that level. But I think if I had been in his situation, I think rather than just this blanket attack on China, I would have tried to pull together our allies. I mean, China is causing a lot of uh, consternation in Europe as well. Uh, and we, we had as a group gone together to, we're dealing with that. I think it would have been far more effective and that's just going it alone, which is the process he's done, which I think up to this point has produced a few, if any, real benefits. So um, I'd like to take advantage of the fact that <clears throat> we have you, such a, such a prominent journalist uh, in our midst here, and, and veer off a little bit and ask about a couple of things that have been in the news, very <laughs> high profile things in the last week. Yes. There have been two, two very high profile stories that have generated lots of discussion in the media and in the public at large. And I'd first like to talk about the Atlantic piece that relied on unnamed sources, quoting yes. the president, calling military members suckers and losers. Um, what is your personal view of using unnamed sources? And the second part of the question is, has the media gotten too lax about this, especially in Washington? Really good question. and. Uh... I think it's particularly true of Washington in general in terms of the anonymous source. It always has been, I think, kind of a problem there. Don and I have always taken the position, we've used as, as few of those as possible over the years. Uh, in terms of quoting them, we would sometimes talk to anonymous sources. We would get leads on things. But we would try to find ways to substantiate whatever it was they told us. Uh, and I think over the years, you will find we use them very few times. So that's sort of a general policy. I think in the case of the Atlantic, though, uh, it's just not much of a stretch, this story. I mean, Trump is on record saying, basically, John McCain was, I don't know if he used the word sucker, but a failure, or a, I can't remember the exact term at this point. Uh, he's a loser. He got, he got captured, spent years in the Hanoi Hilton. I mean, I, that was repeatedly said by Trump. So it's not much of a leap to assume that he's saying the same thing about people we've never heard of who are at a different level. So I think that's why the story is quite believable to a lot of people. Uh, normally you wouldn't do that, but I think because uh, you see the track record there, uh, that, that is believable. And it certainly uh, goes to the heart of his, I think the, the president's character that he says things like this. So this is my one exception to the anonymous source issue. Uh, I think if he hadn't said those things about Trump, he might say, uh, what's going on here? I do hope, like a lot of people, that the sources do come forward and uh, identify themselves. And I wouldn't be surprised if that happens at some point. It's very significant to me that the military men he had around him um, have all been very, very silent during this period. And that silence speaks a lot as far as I'm concerned. So on the issue of unnamed sources, and maybe this is an obvious answer, um, why do you feel that it's so important that journalists don't use, well, don't rely on anonymous sources, and secondly, don't quote them? Well, Two different things, right? What, let me say, I just say that it should be done as little as possible. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes you have no choice. Um, I mean, I did a story 
uh, for Vanity Fair. We did a story several years ago for Vanity Fair on the airlift of billions of dollars to Iraq at the outset of the Iraqi war. And one of the great stories that one person told me is he said, he understood the money was kept in Saddam Hussein's former palace and that a military guy put it in a wheelbarrow and wheeled it up to American contractors to pay them. Pretty great image, right? Uh, I wanted to find that military guy. Eventually I did find him, but I found no reason to quote him because he was still in the service. And I thought it would be very harmful to him at the time, but it was very, I think, important to the story that I found him and get the story confirmed mm -hmm. by what somebody else had told me. So every once in a while, there's an exception to that rule. All I'm saying is you, you, you do it as little as possible because when you do it too much, people aren't sure of the veracity of the information. And that's the problem. And that's why I say with the Atlantic piece, because Trump himself had said almost the same thing about a very famous soldier in this country, it has a real ring of truth to it. So somebody who is, is uh, perhaps best known for uh, his work with anonymous sources, Bob Woodward, um, he's been in the news now too. He's written another book called Rage, in yes. which he quotes the president acknowledging the danger of the coronavirus at a time he was telling the public that it was nothing to worry about. Um, these conversations were taped, so unless they were doctored, there doesn't appear to be a reason to distrust the information. But the issue here that I'd like to know about is what do you think of the timing? I mean, as journalists, we're always used to people feeding us things right before an election and trying to, and they're usually from one side or the other, so you're always cognizant of the fact that you may be being used. But this seems like a rather extraordinary situation. It definitely is an extraordinary situation. Um, and the issue is always, I mean, the, the heart of the issue with uh, Woodward right now is, is why he waited this long to reveal this information. Right. And every, every journalist, uh, whether they're doing a newspaper series or a book, from time to time goes through this. Don and I, over the years, would face some things like that. Never on an issue this grave, by the way something involving public health. Um, and I think personally, he should have published this information, if not after the February interview, certainly after the March interview, uh, because this does involve the public health. And what we do as journalists, we take, what we do is we hold somebody's feet to the fire. If some public official is lying or misleading or misdirecting, and we have direct information that contradicts that on an issue of this magnitude, I think at that point there, there is an obligation to, 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 to bring that out. Um, and um, having said that, I think uh, people are going too far to say that Bob Woodward's got uh, the blood of thousands of people on his hands. I've seen a lot of these statements here and there. I think that's, that's way over the top. Uh, from one thing, if this had been revealed back in the spring, uh, what would Trump's response have been? Uh, that's fake news. Uh, this thing is doctored. That's, it's, it's twisted around. Even, even though there's this audio tape that would seem to confirm exactly what's there, can't you just imagine uh, the spin that would be engaged on that to try to tamp it down? Sure, there would be a lot of controversy about it, uh, but the dust up, I mean, it, at some point would probably uh, die down. Uh, to me, the real crime here goes back when he obviously, Trump knew this stuff in, in December, January. The intelligence people who he has pilloried right and left, obviously, along with the scientists and the medical people said, look, this, this is going to be a real problem. And the crime is rather not just that he, he was saying we got to do all these things, that nothing was put in place to try to prepare the country for what he knew was obviously coming, what was coming that way. So in a way, I'm not really surprised by these revelations that uh, I think the only thing that surprises me is that Trump talked to Woodford I mean, <laughs> that actually surprised what was in me his too. mind about that at the time? And I mean, what did he think he was going to uh, accomplish by this, uh, uh, you know, by this thing? I, 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 and the same thing is true with the Atlantic piece. I mean, it, it, it goes to the heart of um, 
you know, the man, the man's character, Trump's character is out there for really all of us uh, to really see. And there's really not much more, I don't think at this point, that we're going to learn about him. I think whatever happens from now on out is just going to verify some things that we've had a pretty good idea about. So, uh, but I, I would have, I think it would have been a, a torturous process, but I think something of this sort, uh, Bob probably should have published that back then. Well, thank you for that. And I think I, I think we have just a minute or two left and I want to finish off with one question that goes back to our, the bulk of our conversation um, having to do with the middle class. Mm -hmm. And there are questions continuing about education and healthcare and, and for, if there is gonna be education and healthcare for all to build the middle class, how do we pay for it? Well, this is obviously the real problem now that it's been terribly uh, complicated by COVID-19 uh, with the kind of debt that we've run up. Uh, I'm, even before that, the, the 2017 Trump tax bill added tremendously to the deficit unnecessarily in many cases. So we, but I think, I think we're gonna to have to borrow more money. Um, we don't like to be in that position, but I think we, I think we have uh, a tremendous crisis in this company, country with the majority of our people. We've got to figure out a way to deal with some healthcare issues. We've got to figure out a way to get some money into this economy in a way that creates uh, good paying jobs. Uh, that will involve debt. Uh, part of it has to be a tax on people at the top, uh, but part of it's just going to be debt. I mean, the one part of taxes that I didn't mention earlier, corporations, the Trump tax bill drastically reduced the corporate tax rate. Um, not so many decades ago, corporations paid almost 40% of the total amount of income taxes paid in the U.S. The rest was made up by individuals. This year, before COVID-19, even before then, corporations are ending up paying less than 10%. So even a an additional tax on them does not really significantly harm them. And corporations are part of the greater horizon, I mean, environment, family of this country. So they could certainly afford that. But it's probably also going to involve debt. And it probably, I think we've all probably seen these quotes out of the Biden camp, like, boy, when we get there, there's not going to be any money left in the treasury. We're not sure what we're going to do. Uh, I hope they think twice about that in, ter in terms of some of these programs, because I think we are going to have to borrow to try to get the economy on more of a more robust state for average Americans, not for Wall Street, not for folks just at the top, but for the vast bulk of people. Uh, I don't know how else we can do that uh, without some stimulus from the top. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, thank you very, very much for spending your, your time with us. It has been, I think, a very stimulating conversation and we are all grateful. And I wanna thank all of our members of the Spotlight Club and those who might be members of the Spotlight Club. I wanna thank you for joining us and thank you for supporting iNewsSource. Uh, we could not do the journalism we do without you. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Great to be with you.